Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for uh, this month's uh, international seminar. Um, first off, thank you, uh, Marcus and Neriman, for organizing this seminar and putting all of the arrangements in place. Um, as always, we have a very special speaker lined up for today, an old friend of Fabi and with many of the people who've joined um, online, uh, Keith Saito. So Keith grew up in Sudbury, out in Canada, and eventually moved to Vancouver to complete his master's at the University of British Columbia. After that, he moved over to Baren in the Netherlands, where he completed his PhD at CBS with Rob Samson. Um, Keith worked um, as a research scientist at Foreign Tech in Ottawa for a couple of years, until he took up a research scientist role in mycology at Agriculture and Agriculture in Canada, where he worked for 30 years until he retired in 2019. But during his career, he served as president of the International Mycological Association and the International Commission on the Taxonomy of Fungi, served as executive editor for My Mycologia and associate editor for a long list of other uh, journals. He has won several awards, mentored many undergraduate, ABC, and PhD students, as well as postdoctoral scholars, published more than 250 scientific papers and six books. Many of these works have um, been classics and essential reference material for mycologists, both young and old. Um, Keith has four species and three genera named after him, while he himself has described many species, often, often having fun uh, naming them. So he retired as a world leader in, on the taxonomy of hypermycetes, including like toxigenic genera like Aspergillus, Penicillium, and Fusarium. Um, and he also lives in a log house out in the forest with Charlene and soon a new puppy. So I can go on for quite um, some time, but I'll end off by saying that Keith has been quite busy since retiring, focusing his time to write on the interaction, interactions between science, the arts, history, and society. And so today we celebrate um, with him the launch of his book, The Hidden Kingdom of Fungi, that, um, as I mentioned, was recently launched, uh, where he covers many topics um, on how fungi affect us and often without us knowing. And so Keith, thank you very much for spending your morning with us. And I'm sure that everybody who signed in are looking forward to the journey that you will take us on. Good afternoon to all my friends in South Africa and from wherever you are in the world. Uh, did I say good morning? I guess I should say good afternoon. I wanted to thank Cobus and Nariman and uh, Mike and Brenda for the invitation to do this and for their continued friendship over the years. I visited South Africa in both two, 1996 and 2006 and was expecting an invitation in 2016 every 10 years, but for some reason that never happened. So. But life does get complicated. So as Cobus mentioned, the excuse for my seminar today is the publication of my new book, The Hidden Kingdom of Fungi. Um, I have to acknowledge that I had a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation program for the public understanding of science, technology, and economics to support the writing of the book. And I wrote this for what the publishers call a general audience. So I didn't write it for my colleges, but it does mean that all the mycologists among you should buy copies for your friends and relatives who secretly suspect you might be wasting your life. The theme of the book is more or less the relationship of fungi to human affairs. And despite my own reputation as a taxonomist, I assure you there's almost no taxonomy in it. My talk today will expand on three stories that are in the book in a shorter form. And these stories were part of my 2015 and 2017 public lectures called Five Microfungi That Changed the World. A few of you have seen one of these and there are several parts to which the Ottawa group has been exposed several times. So I hope you can tolerate that, but I'm going to put a completely different spin on them here. This is not a data-driven talk. I'm not a scientific researcher anymore. There's no particularly heavy mycology in it either. So I hope that those of you who are not mycologists or perhaps not even scientists will find something of interest here. Some of you have been exposed to my obsessions with the history of science and the nature of invest in, in invention and discovery. 
And this is a part of a series of investigations that led to very interesting places. So I hope you'll find something in it that will help you understand your own roles in science a little better. I dedicate this talk to four of my major mentors. And most of you know the two on the outside, Bryce Kendrick on the left, is the professor who introduced me to mycology as an undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo. And Rob Sampson on the right, who as Cobus mentioned, was my PhD supervisor at what was then CBS. And both these men remain major influential mentors to me. Ian Reid, who I'm sure most of you don't know, gave me my first job in mycology and taught me a lot about experimental design and how to cope with shyness. The late RJ Bandoni, who we all call Dr. B, was my MSc supervisor and I learned from him the joys of field mycology and the importance of multidisciplinary thinking. So, the right time at the right place, what's that about? What do time and place have to do with science? For several years, I often used this quote from Anton Chekhov as an epigraph in my talks. Chekhov was a famous Russian writer, but also a medical doctor, which explains his interest in science. The idea that science is somehow beyond nationalism and that it's beyond politics is an interesting one. Chekhov died before the Russian Revolution, but it was a time when the relationship between science and the state was becoming increasingly complex. So what do you think about this quote? Keep it in the back of your mind. Is this thought true or is it romantic idealism? Let's start by looking at what time and place can mean outside of science. In 2006, I visited South Africa for the second time and I asked Karen Jacobs to take me to Robben Island. There was no particular reason for this, apart from that after my first visit in 1996, I read the whole of Nelson Mandela's 750 page autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom on the 36 hour flight home. And this was the first of four journeys that year that changed my view of the world. And you'll hear about the other three. As a person, I always wondered about the links between a place and the things that happened there. In an emotional or social way, we tend to accept that there's a co connection. Prisons, battlefields, archeological digs, the houses that we live in, we can see there's a psychological and emotional impact. But what about science? So let's think about this. On Robben Island, the prisoners exercised in this yard and the beautiful sites of Cape Town and Table Mountain were only a few kilometers away, but they were hidden from them. It's like they were at the end of the world. They performed heavy labor in these white rocks the reflected sunlight damaged their eyes and they became blind, some of them. And those who couldn't cope were buried here. And here's the place all the tourists wanted to see, Mandela's cell. My own picture wasn't too good and I wanted to find a better picture because it will be poignant a little later on. Now, it's not often that you have a photograph of a moment that changed your life, but here's one for me. At the end of our tour, we were brought into a plain room by our guide who had spent many years on this island as a prisoner. And he asked, do you have any questions? And someone asked how he could stand to be a tour guide in a place where he had experienced such misery. And he replied that he knew his captors were just doing what they had to do and had no more choice about their circumstances than the prisoners did. And he said, I forgive them. And this was a powerful moment for me. And then, although it's beyond the scope of this seminar, it led me to understand the importance of forgiveness for leading a happy life. And this is a constant work for, in progress for me, I have to be honest. But 
uh, but to return to time and place. Here, here in this place, the past and the place were joined together in a way that I couldn't deny. And it was part of a, the start of a journey for me. History was never really an interest of mine, but now I started to suspect that it might be as important as the present. Keeping that in mind, forgiveness for what's happened in that time, in that place, let's begin a different journey. I'm not Irish and I've never worked on Phytophthora. Like all of you, I learned about the Irish potato famine as an undergrad in a textbook, as a textbook example of a devastating plant disease. And this famous painting by Van Gogh, The Potato Eaters, shows the life of Dutch peasants in the late 19th century. Potatoes were a staple food of the poor in Europe. In Ireland, peasant farmers grew wheat and that was exported back to England and sold for profit. They grew the potatoes to feed themselves and potato blight emerged uh, in the US actually in 1844 and then spread to Europe the following year. The summer of 1845 in Ireland was mild and wet, perfect conditions for, for Phytophthora. And the failure of the potato crop in Ireland led to the deaths of about a million people from starvation and disease between 1846 and 1851, with 1847 by far being the worst year. They called the fungus Petritus infestans. It was discovered by the French Frenchman Montaigne, and Montaigne had been a surgeon in Napoleon's army, and he turned to botany when he uh, grew, grew weary of his failure to cure mutilated soldiers. The Re English Reverend uh, Miles Joseph Barclay achieved public notoriety with his outrageous claim that the so-called potato moraine was caused by this fungus. At that time, the idea that a fungus could cause a serious plant disease was madness. The actual cause was obvious to everyone. It had to be electricity caused by all those newfangled wires crisscrossing the country or trains, which appeared about the same time. So let's do Google leaf now. And what Montaigne saw when he examined the bottom of the leaves were the candelabra-like sporulating structures of what we now call Phytophthora dangling down, dropping spores into the soil. One oddity of Phytophthora is that it makes a second kind of spore that swims and the, the cool damp years of the potato famine made these spores a great success because they could swim around in the soil from plant to plant. And this is the trick you'd think you'd expect of an alga. And in fact, that's what Phytophthora is. It's an alga that's lost its chloroplast and set out to, pre to pretend to be a fungus. The potatoes were a crater, dark, smelly, and had little nutritional value. The farmers relied on stored potatoes to make it through the winter, so they tried to save them anyway, but they continued to rot. The landlords took no pity on the farmers and did not let them keep any of the wheat that they grew, leaving them to starve. So the Irish fled, and I'd like to follow a few of their paths. So this is the harbor of Dublin, Ireland. And this depiction of haggard, starving, skeletal people sits beside the waterway in that harbor. It's the work of a Irish sculptor named Rowan Gillespie. Desperate Irish families who could afford the exorbitant price of passage for crammed onto ships that were then consumed by typhus or ship fever. And the vessels were called ghost ships, or if everyone died in the boat sank into the ocean, they were called coffin ships. The National Famine Memorial in Morris County, Mayo in Ireland depicts one such coffin ship with the skeletons of the lost souls hanging from the side The second part of my transformative journey in 2006 started on the final day of our hiking tour on the west coast of Ireland. But the morning sun lights up the land there, it's an astonishing emerald green, and we 
stumbled across this Sagrena famine cemetery. The desolate but beautiful graveyard was built in the sighted sea. You can see it up there at the top. And it's the final resting place for thousands who were unable to escape the famine and search for a better life. My third journey brought me to this place on a pre-conference trip of a joint meeting with the MSA and APS that was held in Quebec City. Imagine you fled Ireland and that your ship has not become a coffin ship and you were lucky enough to make it across the Atlantic into the St. Lawrence River of Canada. And out of the water, like a mirage, arose the big island, Grosseal. The dead had already been tossed overboard and here the ill were torn away from their families and brought to the island. When your boat pulled up to this dock, you were met by nurses and doctors and they led you into a long shed beside the dock and announced that you were in a quarantine station. And the doctor would ask, did you experience fever on the boat? Do you have any open sores? And you'd feel your parched throat searching for swollen thyroid glands. Next, imagine that you are to be disinfected. They take away your clothes and they dress you in a sack. And your contaminated clothing is wheeled off and sterilized in these huge autoclaves. This was 1847. So Pasteur's germ theory hadn't been published yet. So why did they sterilize the clothes? Probably for, for lice. But the head doctor on Grosseal did believe in hygiene. You're stripped and pushed into a harsh shower and your skin is scrubbed by a nurse. And something about the Spartan drabness of this place reminded me of Mandela's cell on Robben Island. Today, at one end of the island, parallel to the shore is the last remaining typhus hospital, a long building called the Lazaretto. The hospital is almost empty now, a quiet and empty place. Messages remain on the walls that were scratched by patients, initials, dates, counting the days. In one room, the windows are covered with a red film that uh, protects the extremely sensitive eyes of those afflicted by typhus from the harsh sunlight outside. It's a short walk from that building to the bank of the river. And the current is strong and the south shore distant enough that no one should have tried to swim across, but many people did drown attempting to escape. In the middle of the island, right by the dock where people could see it when they came in is the graveyard. A glass wall of panels borders one side and the names of nearly 5,000 victims who died on Gros Seal, mostly in 1847 and 1848 are etched into the glass. The story moves west up to St. Lawrence River. Only the apparently healthy were allowed past the quarantine station upriver to Quebec City and beyond. And they appeared healthy, but many of them were not. And they arrived in Toronto, which is the biggest city in Canada now. And this is the corner of Toronto Island Airport called Billy Bishop Airport. And to Ireland Park, which is beside the, these huge mill silos. There's the mill silos. And we see the arrival by the same sculptor who opened the travelogue in Bel Dublin, but installed 10 years later. Similar figures, past quarantine, but not yet past hope. Ill and desperate for care. The outline of the coffin ship is behind and the names of the dead in Toronto are etched into those cracks. There are famine memorials all over the world and here's one in Kingston, Ontario, a few hundred kilometers from where I live. So you can check the list on Wikipedia and see if there's any in your country.
journey number four. And so how many of you recognize this site? A few of you, I think. That's the North Brad Stradbrook Island near Brisbane, Australia on the horizon. And part of the Fabi group on their way to the expanding frontiers meeting that we had there in August, 2006. And I arrived before they did after about 24 hours on uh, airplanes, <laughs> I was just staggered. And I waited in the shade behind where the photographer would be standing here and saw this. So four times in one year, I found myself in the quarantine stations. I felt like somebody was trying to send me a message. The Irish fled to South Africa too, incidentally, and I, I don't know much about that. And, and maybe some of you can search them out for me and, and uh, let me know uh, whether there's any memorials there. So statistics can really be boring, and, and, but these numbers are really staggering. And it, to me, this puts um, this whole famine into incomprehensible perspective. In 1847, the population of Toronto was 20,000 people, 3,000 refugees arrived. Imagine the population of a city tripling in one year from refugees. This should seem familiar. This photograph shows Syrian and Iraqi refugees fleeing war and attempting to find a better world within the last year. So my eyes were open to the story of the famine in Canada by this book, Ship Fever, which is a fictional account of Grosil that stimulated me to visit that place. So I recommend this book to you. So after all that, we need some good news. And uh, penicillin is the archetype of uh, accidental scientific discovery. And, uh, a nice example of the influence of time and space on discovery. Alexander Fleming was a tiny taciturn Scot who liked swimming and playing pool. And like Montaigne, his eyes were open to human suffering when he served as a medic in the trenches of World War I. Then bacterial infection in a soldier or in a mother giving birth or in someone suffering from pneumonia was often fatal. And as the legend goes, he returned from holiday in September 1928 and was sorting through some petri dishes in his lab and discovered a contaminating mold that was inhibiting the growth of a bacterium that he was really trying to grow. And Fleming did what any of us would have done. He took the moldy petri dish to coffee break and he showed it to people while they had coffee and a cigarette. Today, you can visit the tiny laboratory where this happened a happier invocation of mercy, perhaps, than the plaques commemorating, commemorating the Great Famine. It's about a five minute walk from Paddington Station in London. And St. Mary's Hospital, which is uh, where the British royal family goes to have their babies. Fleming worked in a small laboratory on the side of a staircase, basically a closet. So to get into the museum, you enter through a door in the courtyard and climb up the steps. And the lab is a reconstruction based on photographs from the time, such as this one. The management of the museum prohibits photographs of the present version, unfortunately. Um, and this, although the story goes that the mold blew in through the window, the windows are actually sealed. And it's more likely that the mold came up from the mycologist who had the lab downstairs. But in any case, this was certainly not big science. So penicillin, of course, was the first antibiotic shown here in this old chemical model with some not old friends in behind. Fleming wrote a short paper about the phenomenon of antibiosis. It's famous for its vagueness and lack of precise detail. If, if you're a, if you're a mentor trying to teach students to write, this is not a good paper to, <laughs> to use as an example. And then Fleming returned to Lysenzyme afterwards. He would go around squirting lemon juice into people's eyes and collecting the tears. And as far as penicillin goes, he showed little interest in its potential as a drug. And he wondered 
instead whether it could be used as an identification tool for bacteria. And we, all, we all have our inner taxonomist. As the Second World War began, the story shifted to Oxford, where everyone mispronounces fungi like I do. And a group of chemists led by the reserved Australian. Who knew there were reserved Australians? Named Howard Florey, who wanted to assist in the war effort. He had Fleming's culture on his shelves and his staff, especially Ernest, Ernst Chain and Norman Heatley started the complex work of purifying chemical characterization and scale up of the molecule that came to be known as penicillin. And this was during the blitz. So there was a real danger that the laboratory would be bombed into oblivion any night. So the title of this book refers to the fact that lab members painted spores of the culture onto their lab coats so that they could re-isolate the fungus from the clothes if the lab was destroyed and they could start again. There was a mystery about what fungus produced penicillin and little awareness that other, penic other penicillins might produce the compound. The, the strain was considered unique. So now we know there's a clade of species around penicillium chrysogenum that all produce penicillin, but the original strain is now identified by one of the audience members as penicillium rubens. And the CBS Culture Collection in Holland had a copy of Fleming's culture that was discreetly guarded by British soldiers, so it could not be captured by the Nazis. During World War II, penicillin became a, pro a priority and production ramped up so it could be used as a medicine on the battlefield. The Florian chain grew the fungus in all sorts of vessels like hospital bedpans and five gallon drums originally used for dipping cow's udders and all hoping to find a way to get more of the drug. The first samples cured by bacteria that cured bacterial in infections in mice and then, then they injected them into an Oxford policeman who had terrible infections. The policeman would, did well for a while but then they ran out of penicillin. The antibiotic passes through in urine so it could be repurified, uh, a practice that was continued for several years. We do tend to forget what a revolution antibiotics were. The first person who was saved by penicillin died in 1999. To escape the war, the penicillin effort moved to America, Peoria, Illinois, in fact, where the famous uh, NRR culture collection is now and then was there as well. And it became the epicenter of the research. And, and they found a magic ingredient from agricultural waste called corn steep liquor that increased penicillin yields dramatically. They also screened hundreds of strains and including some promising ones that were isolated from South Africa, I assume from the, the, the culture collection that was there at that time. A significant advance was the isolation of a high throughput strain from a cantaloupe purchased in a farmer's market in Peoria by one of the technicians in the USDA lab, a woman whose eccentric interest in microfungi had earned her the nickname Moldy Mary. And this yield yielded the main production strain for penicillin and its descendants now heavily modified genetically are what are used for production today. So there's a Canadian twist to this story and a colleague of Fleming's named Roland Hare was transferred to Toronto to oversee the massive penicillin production in preparation for D-Day, which was the climactic battle of the war. A building on the campus of the University of Toronto was occupied by the pharmaceutical company Canon and transformed into a drug factory. And this, anyone who's been to Toronto will recognize that they've seen this building. And there's a blue plaque by the stairwell, describing the use of the building as a penicillin factory. Sometimes my colleges go there to be photo photographed. I wanted to quickly show you a series of pictures taken um, during the war, but not in Oxford or Peoria, but in this building in Toronto. So 
you'll recognize many of the methods are, are still used in microbiology labs today, but not, not this method. Whoops. Penicillin production was mostly a solid state fermentation. Whoops, the second one. But uh, sometimes liquid fermenters were used. What's striking about many of these photographs to me is how many women were working in the labs. My, my mother frequently complained to me that her career as a teacher was terminated by the return of men from the uh, Second World War. It was the me men whose families needed the support of a job that women had to re retire. So Fleming's legacy. He won the Nobel Prize along with uh, Florian Chain, the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. And he became one of the most famous scientists of the 20th century. He was adored everywhere and there are just as many memorials to him as there are to the great famine all over the world. Like this one in Barcelona, which is tucked away beside a children's playground near a shopping mall. Or this one, uh, which enshrines Fleming in stained glass in St. James Church near St. Mary's Hospital, where it all began. So I want to play one little video of uh, Fleming so you can hear his voice. Well, I got contaminations, and when I looked at them a week afterwards, all sorts of contaminations, but one of them was a uh, mold. Now, by contamination with a mold, do you mean the sort of thing that happens to a housewife if she leaves the top off her jam too long, that sort of thing? That's exactly the same. I don't know if you could hear that, but did you notice he lost his Scottish accent? Fleming loved the attention, and despite his, you would see, complete lack of charisma, uh, he was interviewed countless times and, and repeated the same story over and over again, which I admit is something I'm starting to experience myself. Fleming recreated his original Petri dish culture many times, and he sent dried signed copies to friends, colleagues and dignitaries, and even the royalty. And a few years back, one of these sold at auction for 14,000 pounds. Some of the cynicism about Fleming is well-founded, but only partly his fault. His first notoriety was reflected by a nickname, Private 606, which referred to an arsenic compound that could be injected intravenously to cure syphilis. Many of uh, Fleming's colleagues felt that he lived the standard of luxury far above what his salary could support. So there were allegations that he supplemented his income by providing a service to aristocracy suffering from this most unaristocratic disease. Many people felt that the true glory, the hard work was done by others. And here's a monument in the Oxford Botanical Garden memorializing the efforts of those who worked on penicillin. Fleming's name is absent. I really like this story because it feels like real science to me. A chance observation, competitive colleagues, competing technologies, troubled marriages, commercial interests, intellectual property disputes, war, <laughs> international intrigue. It's a confluence of a time filled with complexity, a place, a dirty lab in an old hospital, battlefields, and a person, a scientist who was there at that time. This is a very human story, in other words. When I think of Fleming, I think of this quote from Roland Hare, whose book is one of the finest on the history of penicillin. And so this sh little shy, almost artic inarticulate Scott we all loved so much. Whatever people thought of Fleming later, those who worked with him were clearly fond, with, fond of him. And second, while credit for the antibiotic revolution has to be shared with other drugs, especially streptomycin, which turned back the scourge of tuberculosis and with other scientists. I, I want you to remember that the antibiotic revolution in medicine increased the average lifespan of human beings by about 15 years. 
15 years. Imagine our lives without this. Without penicillin, many grandparents would never have met their grandchildren. Alexander Fleming was knighted and buried in St. Paul's Cathedral, and you can pay the admission price and pay your respects if you care to. I have. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. This all leads to fungus number three, Aspergillus. And the last part of the seminar is not a travelogue for me, but one of many stories where, it, where it's the fungus that's the tourist. If you're Catholic, you know an aspergillum has a silver handle with holes or short tubes covering a ball at the end. It's dipped into holy water, which is then flipped onto babies in the sacrament of baptism. The drops of water shower onto the baby's head just as the chains of spores scatter from the head of a fungus while welcoming the child into the world. And here's what aspergillus looks like through a real microscope. You can see the resemblance. Any mycologist worth his immersion oil would recognize that as an aspergillus. In real life, aspergillus can be quite beautiful and looks like this. So our story of aspergillus starts with turkeys. And in case you live in a place where eating such birds is not part of your holiday culture, these are wild turkeys in my yard, strutting about, making a mess. And if you're a bird, especially if you're a turkey, you might consider flying off to another world because this fungal planet is not for you. These are the kind of domesticated turkeys we eat in the Western world. They've changed quite a bit from the wild variety and have been fattened up a bit and learned to play football. I don't wanna to make too much fun of turkeys. They too deserve our respect. But if you were a turkey living in the UK in 1960, many of your relatives and friends succumbed to something that the newspapers called Turkey X disease. And this has nothing to do with the X-Files. Turkeys are not demanding, but one thing they must surely take for granted is that the farmers who raised them to be food are at least gonna give them the right food. In the 1960s, that food was peanut meal, good stuff. High in protein, tasty, just imagine those smacking turkey beaks and wanting more and more and more. This was a, in a time of food rationing still after the war and all the good nuts were used for people. So the turkeys got second rate nuts from Brazil. Unfortunately, as we know from the X-Files, Aspergillus loves peanuts too. If peanut butter is one of the things that gives your life deep meaning, or if you prefer your food organic and visit the natural food store regularly to avoid chemical additives, perhaps you should check your phone now and come back later. The species that loves peanuts is called Aspergillus flavus, and it makes one of the most deadly natural toxins known, aflatoxin. Those poor turkeys were apparently succumbing to acute aflatoxin poisoning, but the story was just beginning. The sick turkeys led to investigations of human diseases and revealed the widespread chronic aflatoxin poisoning in humans, uh, causing in particular liver cancer. When it became clear that Flavus also had a fondness for maize, we found that corn products were often contaminated with aflatoxin also. And that aflatoxin is heat stable and it survives cooking. It was discovered that feeding aflatoxin contaminated grain to cattle not only contaminated their meat, but that the toxin was passed on in a modified form into their milk. Corn products were then reg also regulated and plant breeders began to develop resistant plants and tried to find ways to reduce contamination. Oddly, it turns out that not all strains of Aspergillus flavus make aflatoxin. Some that don't have been classified as a separate species, Aspergillus arisi, which is used for the fermentation that gives us uh, soy sauce. And for, for decades, Aspergillus taxonomists have had polite discussions just kidding, 
um, whether Arisi and Flavus were two species of one. Genome studies show them to be 99.5% identical, but more interesting than that, domestication has occurred several times. Sometimes the aflatoxin genes are gone in Arisi and sometimes they're only masked, but there's always um, a, a lot of amylase, amylase genes giving Orizi its talent for modifying the starches and rust uh, in rice. How is it that the ancient Asian microbiologists happened to choose strains that did not produce aflatoxin. Was it just luck? How did they distinguish the new dangerous wolf from the friendly dog? There must have been some unhappy accidents along the way, but modern day soy sauce is perfectly safe. Um, and Aspergillus arisi is one famous fungus. The Japanese love their uh, Aspergillus and all the other little microfungi that help them make food. So they have a series of animated cartoons about agricultural microorganisms called Myoshimon. And one of the most popular characters is Aspergillus arisi. So please just sing along if you know the song. Um, we have, have to love these happy little molds flying around dancing and smiling. And there's penicillium there too. But we have to return to the dark side. Starting with the observation of dying turkeys on English farms, the aflatoxin problem spread its arms around the globe. It was a terrible problem that had always existed, but we hadn't noticed. In the tropics or other areas where homegrown food is common, it remains a serious concern. Aflatoxin is considered a group one carcinogen, which means that there's no doubt about its effects and there is no safe level of exposure. But for those of us in the developed world, aflatoxin is less of a worry. Most countries strictly regulate the amount of aflatoxin in the parts per billion range. Unfortunately, several parts of the world are at high risk and they lack effective regulations, particularly in Africa where maize and peanuts remain a staple food source. Along with hepatitis B, aflatoxin is one of the main causes of liver cancer. And acute aflatoxin poisoning is the leading cause of childhood illness. According to some estimates, aflatoxin kills more people in the world every year than malaria does. Let me say that again. Aflatoxin kills more people than malaria does. Science funders need to be more aware of this. Put these two maps together and you see the problem quite clearly. Most of the countries that have strict aflatoxin regulations are temperate, while tropical countries have the most aflatoxin in their crops and suffer the most disease. Many tropical countries can only get cash by selling their best food to the rich temperate countries, and they keep the contaminated food for their own people and livestock. This is a very uncomfortable consequence of international trade. In fact, overexposure to mycotoxins is one of the main factors separating rich and impoverished nations. So we end where we began. In 2006, after we visited Robben Island, Karen brought me to visit Professor Marassas at his lab in MRC in Tigerberg. Wally was one of the world's leading mycotoxin mycologists and he was passionate about using his knowledge to improve public health. He was very concerned about aflatoxin, and this is a very delicate story. In some parts of the world, you can buy dog food that is certified to be aflatoxin free, but it can be difficult to be sure that the same can be said about what you feed to your children. I've done a lot of thinking about what to say here that might be helpful about the aflatoxin situation in Africa in general and in South, South Africa in particular. All around the world, we've been coping with a combination of threats to public health and science denial in our own ways. As Scully says, the truth is out there and you just need to look. You can start by Googling the name of your country with the word aflatoxin and see where that path takes you. But just to warn you, there are some dark corners that might make you wonder about your role in your time and place. If you're interested in the big picture on mycotoxins and public health, you might start with a PDF of this book. 
which is available from the International Agency on Research on Cancer. It was edited by the late John Pitt, another friend of South Africa, who I spent some time with on my first visit to Stellenbosch in 1996. So here we have our three fungi reunited under the banner of the right time and the right place. With each story, you can see science as a reaction to the needs of the time. A starving, starving population, people dying of wartime infections, animals and people being poisoned by their food. With each story, you can see science that assumes importance because of the place that it happens the countries, the economic activity and the borders between them and the laboratories within. And of course, you can see the people, you can see the scientists working on the problems and the citizens needing the solution. So I bring you back to Chekhov's statement. And while I agree it's noble, I can only decide that it's false. In each of these stories, the national interest did spill over and, and have consequences on the international scene but the solutions arose from national priorities, but in the best possible way. There was always a willingness to share valuable discoveries with others, but that's not always true. This recent book more or less trashes Chekhov's premise by focusing on scientific advances made for military interests. Doesn't sound like there's much noble in that, but we can thank it for the internet that makes this presentation possible today and all the computer and iPad technology that's joined together in a way that would have seemed like magic 50 years ago. This book just came out and it looks at scientific advances of the past several hundred years that came from non-Western, non-Christian countries. Modern day science still has difficulty coping with ideas and discoveries that come from different times and different places. I like Pasteur's quote better. I suspect this quote from an 1884 conference, imagine if there'll be any quotes from our conferences 150 years from now. I think this is where Chekhov's idea may have originated, but Pasteur acknowledges that discoveries occur in the laboratories of specific countries, but that the benefits should be for all humanity. But if the profits is of science are for all, scientists themselves serve the interests of their own country, their own time, and their own place. The importance of time and space plays out in a different way in scientific discovery. The, the American science writer, Stephen Johnson, has been delving into this for several years, trying to understand why certain discoveries happen at certain times in certain places. And in Johnson's interpretation, innovations are only possible if the supporting theoretical, technological, or mechanical framework already exists. Most breakthroughs use existing pieces of technology and knowledge for new purposes, what is called the adjacent possible. It's rare to skip steps as research moves into the unknown and novel. Innovation increases when we know what pieces are available or by adding new pieces. And the adjacent policy, the adjacent possible is kind of a metaphor for knowing your field or knowing the literature or knowing the achievements of the past. But whether or not we stand on the shoulders of giants, our success depends on the quality of our view of the adjacent possible. So if we look at the stories that we consider today, we can see how each leap was made possible by applying existing technology and existing knowledge into new domains, microscopes, germ theory, advances in chemical and computer technology. And to put this in today's terms that are easy for those of you in the audience to understand, you can't sequence a genome or understand it without the right technology or supporting theory being available. Or to put it another way, you have to be in the right place at the right time. Thank you.